All right, hello everybody, and welcome back to um, Classical Dynamics of Particles. Um, today we're going to be going over Chapter 7. This is going to be kind of a long chapter, so I'll probably record it in parts, so sorry if there are some obvious cuts. But Chapter 7 goes over Hamilton's principle, and we get into the uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian dynamics. So without further ado, let's get into the introduction, where basically the main point of the introduction introduction um, is that we've basically been describing um, dynamics in terms of Newton's equation uh, which says the forces are equal to the uh, time derivative of the momentum so um, this was a useful way to basically run through problems and stuff and what we quickly find though is as we try to get to more and more complex problems or certain problems uh, yeah, we have to include a lot of forces of constraint um, and it gets really difficult to basically describe the motion of a system. Um, and that's basically what the problem we have with Newton's formulation of dynamics. Because we have to know all the forces. That's what this F is, right? This F is F net, or you might have seen as some of the forces. So that makes it really hard to describe a system. So instead, um, we've devised other methods of doing this, uh, which is kind of contained in Hamilton's principle. Now, uh, and we'll get into what that is in 7.2. Hamilton's principle. And then from this principle, we get some equations which are called Lagrange's equations. Um, and basically the point of this chapter is to sort of see a different way to solve problems and then convince yourself that uh, these Lagrange equations based off Hamilton's principles is equivalent to our normal Newtonian dynamics. So okay, let's get into 7.2. Point 2. Hamilton's principle. So Hamilton's principle is a minimal principle, uh, which we've seen a lot of in physics. Um, uh, where the first of the principles were developed in the field of optics, uh, where the hero of Alexandria was trying to find a law that governed the reflection of light. And he asserted that it takes the shortest possible path. And this wasn't actually true because it wasn't until Fermat who had his uh, principle of least time, which gives us Snell's law of reflection. Um, so basically, minimal principles are everywhere in physics, uh, from Newton, Leibniz, Bernoulli. Um, and basically, Hamilton's principle is the evolution of this concept. Um, so basically, in 1828, Gauss basically wanted to treat mechanics with his principle of least constraint, um, which then was ad adapted by a guy named Hertz, who took it to the next level, I suppose, into the principle of least curvature. And then from there on, basically, Hamilton was the first person to have the most general formulation of this minimal principle. And what it basically says is, of all the possible paths which a dynamic dynamical system may move, from one point to another within a specified time interval um, consistent with any constraints, the actual path followed is that which minimizes the time integral of the difference between the kinetic and potential energies. So what that basically means in an equation form is if you remember variations from chapter six where delta is the shorthand notation um, for the uh, variational formula where we have you know the function in there uh, refer to chapter 6 for the delta. Um, basically tells us that we want to minimize this right here. Okay. Or this to give us the minimum, sorry. Um, now the variational principle from chapter 6 tells us that this integral right here is an extremum, either minimum or maximum. Um, but as is in most cases, it's usually a minimum. Um, so we can basically rewrite these equations 
into the Lagrangian. So if we set the kinetic energy equal to, um, well, it's just the kinetic energy dependent on the time derivative of the position, and the potential energy is of just the position itself. Uh, the difference of these two quantities is what we call the Lagrangian, and it's defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. So then we could rewrite our um, variational integral as uh, basically we're trying to minimize the Lagrangian now. The integral of the Lagrangian, sorry. And from 6.5, right? Uh, in the previous chapter, we know that this is basically the general formulation. So this function is the Lagrangian. And now we can make some transformations. Um, and we see that if x goes to t, uh, y depends on x of t, y prime is just the time derivative of x of t, and therefore this function is just the Lagrangian. So that lets us rewrite uh, the Euler's equations, basically Euler-Lagrange equations from chapter 6, again, into the Lagrange equations of motion, which comes directly from the calculus of variations. And here we have the general expression for uh, Lagrange equations of motion. Um, and we just call L the Lagrangian. So let's use this for a simple example. So let's use it for a one-dimensional dimensional harmonic oscillator, something we saw and solved in uh, with Newtonian mechanics. So let's write our Lagrangian. So it's the kinetic energy minus the potential. So it's 1 half mx dot squared minus 1 half kx squared. Um, and then let's find basically these three values. Uh, so since i is only 1 because it's one dimensional, uh, i only goes from 1 to 1. Derivative with respect to x is just negative kx. Um, derivative with respect to x prime is just um, mx, mx dot, sorry. And then the time derivative of that just turns that into basically ma. And then from this, we can immediately put this into equation 7.4, which is this right here, right? So we have, let's just do that actually, uh, negative kx minus mx double dot equals zero, okay? And that tells us that mx double dot plus kx equals zero. Right? And that's the exact same expression uh, that we got from Newtonian mechanics. So it's good that it works this example, but we will want to show later on that these two equations are actually fundamentally mathematically equivalent. So let's look at um, one more example where let's consider uh, a pendulum. Okay? So in a pendulum, um, I could draw a picture as well, actually. We have a pendulum. Uh, I guess it's like that. And then, you know, it swings with an angle theta, drawing out an arc, right? <clears throat> so we can rewrite the Lagrangian uh, in terms of theta instead of x and just have that be our coordinate of interest. Um, and when we write the kinetic energy right, that's one half m, and then it's right, it's one half m x squared plus one half m y squared. But we can rewrite that in terms of theta, and um, we get l omega quantity squared, right? And then we have our potential energy is m g y, where in this case wherever the object is, right here, whatever, that is given by the usual triangle relation of one minus cosine theta, or L times one minus cosine theta, <coughs> times mg. And then from then on, <coughs> we could just do, use the exact same formula. Again, basically plugging into this equation right here. And we take our derivatives and we get the exact same expression we got from Newtonian mechanics, but I think a little bit faster. Okay. So 
What's important to note basically from doing it this way with the Lagrangian is nowhere did we mention any concept of force, basically. All we did was we talked about the kinetic and potential energies of the particle and didn't take into account the external stuff happening on it, right? So basically Hamilton's principle allows us to calculate the equations of a motion uh, without using Newton's theory at all. And that's an important point that we're gonna see later on. So okay, uh, before we delve deeper into uh, Lagrangian Hamiltonian dynamics, let's talk a bit about generalized coordinates. So what we basically kind of saw this right here is instead of using x and y coordinates to describe our system, we chose theta. In other words, in a lot of situations, there's a better coordinate to choose, right? So what this section basically talks about, I'm going to try to summarize it, is in three dimensions, basically, like rectangular coordinates, um, if we have n discrete point particles, we need basically three n quantities to describe the positions of all the particles, right? Because each one has x, y, and z, right? And same with like, you know, f like uh, cylindrical or spherical coordinate systems. But if there exist equations of constraint that relate some of these coordinates to others, like let's say two particles have to be stuck together, um, then basically not all three n coordinates are independent. And if there are m equations of constraints, then we have three n minus m coordinates that are independent. In other words, we have three n minus m degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, and this is true also for spherical and cylindrical. Um, so basically, depending on the problem that we have, it can be more useful to choose uh, parameters that have like dimensions of energy, length squared, dimensionless, and so forth, depending on what the problem gives you and what you're asked to solve for. So we basically say that generalized coordinates are any set of quantities that completely specifies the state of a system. And we write them as Q1, Q2, Q3, dot, 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 in other words, QJ. Um, and a set of independent generalized coordinates whose number equals the number of degrees of freedom of the system, um, not restricted by the constraints, is the proper set. This is just fancy terminology, basically. Um, so, basically, in a lot of instances, it could be useful to use generalized coordinates uh, more than the proper set, so we can add some more coordinates to make it easier to do the math, um, which we'll see later um, with the Lagrange undetermined multipliers. But um, let's not get into that for now. So. Basically, since there's an infinite way to represent um, coordinates, there's actually an infinite number of uh, quantities that you can choose from. So we basically want to figure out a way to figure out what coordinates are actually suitable to use and are simple enough to just understand it, basically. Um, like a simple example is with like potential energy, I could set my height equal to zero here, or I could set it my height equal to zero here and infinitely high, infinitely low, so forth. That's what I mean by infinite. Um, okay, we can also define from generalized coordinates, uh, generalized velocities, uh, which as you can probably guess, is simply the time derivative of the coordinates. So Q1 dot, Q2 dot, 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 dot and it's qj dot. So 
we can allow that these equation uh, we can allow for the possibility that the equations um, connecting basically are non-generalized coordinates um, and are generalized coordinates we can basically create a set of transformation equations um, so oh, actually let me do a screenshot it's probably easier and uh, this J spans from 1 to S, where S is equal to 3M minus N. It's the uh, degrees of freedom of your system. And this is assuming you have N particles. Oh, that should be 3N minus M. Sorry about that. Um, and then from there on, you can also get the um, generalized velocities, and you can do inverse transformations as well. Okay, so let's take an example because that was a little confusing. Um, let's find a suit of generalized coordinates for a point particle moving on the surface of a hemisphere of radius r whose center is at the origin. So we have spherical uh, symmetry and we know the particle moves on the surface of a hemisphere, right? So that basically lets us immediately write, uh, we can normalize our stuff by r. So we can write our generalized coordinates as in Cartesian, simply the normal x, y, z over r. Um, and since we know that the directional cosines of a line equals unity, uh, we know the squares of each add up to one. Right, since these are normalized by r. So it's basically like a unit hemisphere. However, um, this is not the proper set because we have an equation of constraint because we can write z in terms in terms of x and y or you can pick whichever one you want so, uh, like you know x in terms of y and z it's more customary to do z in terms of x and y and we can basically drop down our um, generalized coordinates to just two and we can see this here and this is because the equation of constraint is z is equal to square root r squared minus x squared minus y squared so here we found a way that we can reduce it that you can always reduce it to the proper set of coordinates from a generalized set of coordinates by using equations of constraint so let's look at an example a little bit more in depth so when we when we did the pendulum maybe it wasn't so clear where everything came from but since we kind of already already talked about it i'm going to quickly brush over this just so we can see the math so here we have our simple pendulum right we want to know we want to find the lagrangian right where the lagrangian is t is equal to one half mx dot squared plus one half my dot squared so forth whereas earlier right we had just one half m L squared theta squared right um, but we can get the same thing since we have the equations of constraint that X is equal to L sine theta Y is equal to negative L sine theta so we can find uh, X dot and Y dot and from here we can see that um, basically you can reduce this equation into this equation um, and we see that if we do that, um, and we take our respective derivatives for our equation, basically the calculus of variations, or variational calculus, we get the same answer as if we had just done theta in the beginning. Okay. So... That was basically an introduction to generalized coordinates. Um, and we can kind of see that you can do more or less work depending on what coordinates you choose. But you always get the same answer. Or an equivalent answer, I should say. Okay. Let's get into 7.4, which is Lagrange's equations in generalized coordinates. So I don't want to write that because it's kind of long. So I'm going to try to save a bit of time because this chapter is very long. And let's try, let's kind of look at a, uh, 
different way of restating Hamilton's principle um, in, involving the Lagrangian. So, of all the possible paths along which a dynamical system may move from one point to another in configuration space within a specified time interval, the actual path is that which minimizes the time interval of the Lagrangian function for the system. Now that's actually identical to the to the earlier uh, definition I put here because this right here is the Lagrangian by definition. But that's just now that we know what the Lagrangian is. So um, we can set up the variational form of, of Hamilton's principle in generalized coordinates. Um, and we also may take advantage of an important property of the Lagrangian. And that's because the Lagrangian rate is the difference of the kinetic and potential energies. In other words, the Lagrangian is a scalar function. And those are usually a lot easier to deal with, right? Um, and that means basically a scalar function means it has to be invariant with respect to coordinate transformations. And that's why you always get the same answer. Uh, with respect to coordinate transformations. And this should make sense because it wouldn't make sense depending on what coordinates we choose to get a different equation of motion, right, for the pendulum, right? The pendulum's always going to move the same. It doesn't care what coordinates you use to describe it, right? The motion is the same. So that means we can write the Lagrangian in terms of these generalized coordinates. And we basically get Hamilton's principle, which is stop. Okay, that is uh, my sign to get my laundry, so I will um, stop this now and I'll continue recording when I get back. All right, I am back and I'm making a tea right now, so sorry if you hear a bit of background noise. Um, but basically we just saw that we just got Hamiltonian's, Hamilton's, sorry, um, principle uh, in the Lagrangian and generalized coordinates. So we can basically make similar transformations slash identifications as before and using the Euler's equation right which is this right here uh, we basically see that we have s equations to solve degrees of freedom right to completely uh, encapsulate our system right so okay um, these are basically the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion of the system, and they're usually called Lagrange's equations. Um, again, S of them. And basically, what's important to note is that there's two basically conditions that we need to have in order for these equations to be valid. Uh, the forces acting on the system, apart from any force of constraint, must be derivable from a potential or several potentials. Because remember, we're not actually talking about potentials here. We're talking, I mean, forces are talking about potentials instead, right? We're using energy. So the physical force, right, has to be uh, able to be written as a potential. And then the equations of constraint must be relations that connect the coordinates of the particle and maybe functions of the time. That is, we must have constraint relations of the form given by equation 7.9, which for uh, your guys' sake, I will screenshot here. That's 7.9. Okay. Um, and my T is done, so let me go pick that up real quick. We're on 7.17. Okay. Okay. So let's go with an example once I get my T. Um, also an important point to note is that we've kind of only been dealing with conservative forces and I think we will actually for this entire chapter but it is very possible and uh, apparently pretty easy to uh, formulate Hamilton's principle to include uh, non-conservative stuff as well so it's not a restriction on basically this methodology of solving problems so let's consider um, the case of projectile motion under gravity that I think we went over in seven point, or sorry, two point six, um, um, and we want to find the equations of, of motion in both Cartesian and polar coordinates. So this is kind of a good example to see why one way of choosing coordinates is better than the other. So um, we write our <laughs> kinetic energy, 
our potential energy. So remember the Lagrangian is just the difference of the two, or it's the kinetic minus the potential. Um, and then we can find um, our Lagrangian equations for both the x and the y. So for the x direction, right, we get uh, no acceleration, right? That's what we expect. It's projectile motion, right? For the y direction, we get the acceleration is negative g, which, you know, it's probably a lot easier to do in, like, Newtonian mechanics. Um, but now let's see what happens if we do it in terms of uh, polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, right, we can write our kinetic energy is one half m r dot squared, right, plus one half m r theta dot squared. Okay, and then we have a potential energy as well, and we can get the Lagrangian again, and then write it for the r and theta direction. Same amount of equations, but notice there's a lot more work, um, and that's because um, in the polar system, the potential energy depends on both r, right, and theta, and that's two of our coordinates, and that's not as nice as we're in the Cart Cartesian system, right? It just depends on y, right? One coordinate. So basically, this problem kind of goes to show you that the Cartesian system would have been a better choice. Uh, now let's look at, I think, a more interesting example because that's pretty basic. Um, let's see what happens if a particle of mass m is constrained to move inside the surface of a smooth cone of half angle alpha. Um, so we have an equation of constraint, right? Because it has to be stuck to the cone. So z is equal to r cotangent alpha. Um, and then, um, since we know there's only two degrees of freedom for the system, we only need two proper generalized coordinates. So we can use this equation right here to um, eliminate either z or r, right? Because if you write something in terms of z, you can always shift over to r since alpha is just a constant. So let's eliminate z. And in doing so, we can write the Lagrangian as 1 half m r dot squared cosecant squared alpha plus r squared theta squared theta dot squared, sorry, minus mgr cotangent alpha. Uh, this right here is just mgz, right? Yep, we can see the do it here. Okay. Um, and what we want to note first is that the Lagrangian does not explicitly contain theta. Right, it contains theta dot, but not theta. So immediately we know uh, del L del theta is equal to zero, right? So since we know that, that tells us then that this also has to be equal to zero, right? Because the difference between the two has to be zero. In other words, um, uh, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the to omega, basically, the time derivative of theta is mr squared omega. In other words, this right here we just wrote right now is um, i omega is conserved. In other words, conservation of angular momentum. So physics still holds. Angular momentum. Okay, so the theta direction was not very useful because it just tells us that angular momentum is conserved. Um, but in the r direction, and I'll screenshot their explanation as well for angular momentum, um, we get basically uh, this expression, which is the equation of motion for the system. And we'll see in section 8.10, so next chapter, uh, this motion in a little bit more detail. Okay, so for brevity's sake, um, also, hey Google, do I have any timers? No, you don't have any timers set oh, crap. at the moment. Hey Google, set a timer for 45 minutes. 45 minutes, and we're starting now. Sorry guys, that's for my laundry. Um, we're gonna, what I was trying to say was that we're going to be skipping the next example for sake of time. Uh, I encourage you to go through it yourself. Um, but I prefer to go over... Um, the example 7.6 instead because it's with uh, like small uh, I just think it's a it's a better problem so we're well, skipping 7.5 going to 7.6 straight um, and we want to basically find the frequency of small oscillations of a simple pendulum 
uh, placed in a railroad car that has a constant acceleration A in the X direction. Okay, so let's draw a picture. So we basically have a railroad car accelerating to the right, and then we have a pendulum that's swinging, and uh, we're told that there's some equilibrium angle due to the car's acceleration and the acceleration of gravity G, and if we can find that, and then basically expand around that and find this frequency of small oscillations. Okay, so let's write down our Lagrangian. Um, there it is, right? Since we only have x and y direction, that's all we care about since nothing's moving vertically, right? Or in the z direction. I mean, sorry, nothing's moving like into the page or out of the page. And that's the z direction. Um, we only care about x and y. And we can basically rewrite that, right, as in terms of theta. Um, and then immediately we can see that theta is the only generalized coordinate, right? Because we can rewrite x and y as theta. Um, and that lets us basically. Uh, reuse our answer from before um, from 7.2 or sorry in problem 7.2 in the after this chapter um, you'll get basically the same expression I'm assuming they just ask you to uh, you know do the uh, del L del theta minus del del T of del L, del theta, uh, I always forget which one's dot, this one's dot, the time derivative one's dot, oh yeah, because that's to be the same units, okay, um, so doing so, we get this expression for the equation of motion, um, and we can determine the equilibrium, equilibrium angle by setting theta equal to theta e, so this is now theta e, and then this goes to zero, because it's the equilibrium, right? And then we immediately can get that tangent of theta e is equal to negative a over g. Okay, and we have found the equilibrium angle, but now, remember the problem asks us to find the frequency of small oscillations. So since we're at the equilibrium, we just have to basically expand by that by a small parameter, uh, eta, which I remember the Greek letter's name now. Uh, and in doing so, we can expand the cosine and sine uh, first by using uh, trigonomic identities for sine of the sum of angles, and then by expanding, um, remember, small angle, theta, very, very small, um, basically sine of theta is approximately theta, cosine of theta is approximately one, that's the, that's the approximation they use here. Um, and then we basically get that this small deviation, eta, uh, after simplifying stuff, is equal to negative one over L, G cosine theta equilibrium minus A sine theta equilibrium eta. Um, and you may be wondering how the simplification happened. Well, this term right here in the brackets, right, what is g sine theta e plus a cosine theta e? Well, if we go up here, right, it's um, zero by definition, actually, because it's these two things added together, which we, when we set to equal to zero when it's theta e. Um, okay, so then from here on, we can just uh, solve for um, eta and simplifying it with a little bit of algebraic manipulation and trig identities basically, we get these expressions and we can basically uh, then write that omega, right, <clears throat> because this is just basically simple harmonic motion, we know this right here is the frequency of oscillation um, and we can kind of check what happens if the railroad car <clears throat> is stationary? Do we get the same thing from a normal pendulum that we expect? This goes to zero, we get square root uh, g over L for omega, right? So yes.
It works. Good. Um, I'm trying to see which next one I want to do. There's two more examples in this section, and I want to do just one more. Mm. Let's do the bead sliding down. Okay. <clears throat> so I actually went through all these examples uh, beforehand, which is rare for me to do since I usually just uh, talk to you guys as I go through it myself. But I was on a long, well, not that long. I was on an airplane flight, and I just spent the entire flight reading my chapter, reading this chapter. So. Um, I guess if that's what you like to do, that's what you like to do. Uh, but okay, so we have a bead sliding down a smooth wire um, bent in basically the shape of a parabola. Okay, let's show a picture of what that looks like. I kind of cut out the name, but it says figure. Um, so we have our, our uh, parabola, Jesus. Um, and we can kind of see that that makes concentric circles, right? as you go down, and then your equation of constraint, right, is obviously just the parabola, um, right? And then um, we can basically just immediately get the Lagrangian because we have the kinetic energy, we have the potential, so we can rewrite Z in terms of R and so forth. Um, and since we know it's rotating, we all have an explicit time dependence on angular rotation, and we can rewrite the entire Lagrangian as so. So we have T minus U, okay? Uh, since we know that theta dot is just omega, since we're given omega. Um, from then on, right, it's just, can we calculate our values uh, that we go into the equation? As a reminder, the equation is del L, del R, minus del, del T of del L, del R dot, where basically the only thing that changes is the variable you're doing it with respect to. And in this case, our only generalized coordinate rate is R, since omega is unknown. Uh, that's, we only have to do it once, basically. Uh, and this all equals zero, sorry. Um, doing that, basically solving it out, we get this expression right here, okay, uh, which seems pretty complicated, but let's say that the bead rotates with R equals R constant. In other words, uh, the bead somehow is managing to stay up here because it's rotating at the perfect frequency, for example, then we can basically set this equal to zero uh, this equal to zero, and we just have this right here, and we get, oops, let me, I need to erase that. Uh, we just get R of 2GC minus omega squared is equal to zero. So we can get C equals omega squared over 2G, which is what we wanted since it was asking us to solve for, um, find the value of C basically, uh, when the bead rotates in a circle of radius r. So we saw that a bunch of simplifications can happen and it makes the problem a lot easier. Um, the next example is also pretty good, but I'm gonna skip it, I think, because otherwise this video is gonna be over two hours long. Okay, and I don't know if I'll be able to record all of it today, so sorry. Um, okay, let's get into 7.5, which I think I kind of briefly hinted at. Um, when I was talked about Lagrange with undetermined multipliers. So let's look into what this really means. So we were looking at Lagrange's equations with undetermined multipliers. Um, basically, um, constraints that can be expressed as algebraic uh, relations among the coordinates are what we call hol holonomic constraints. Holonomic, I'll say it like that, see if that's wrong. Um, and if a system is subject only to these holonomic constraints, we can always find a proper set of generalized coordinates in terms of which the equations of motion are free from explicit references to those constraints. Um, but sometimes you want to know those constraints. Um, so any constraints that must be expressed in terms of the velocities of the particle in the system are of the form, basically, the function is zero. Um, and these constitute non-holonomic constraints 
unless these equations can be integrated to yield relations among the coordinates. So let's consider a constraint relation of this form right here, where some number, uh, or just some prefactor, times the velocity plus some constant is equal to zero. Um, if we want the equation, or in general, sorry, this equation is non-integratable, but um, if they have these special forms, A and B, right, then you can integrate it. And it tells you um, that if you integrate basically this right here, you get f of x t minus some constant is equal to zero, right? Okay, so it's actually holonomic, even if it has this form, as long as a and b are subject to those uh, constraints. Okay, so let's change the dependence on the coordinates to generalized coordinates, um, and we can see that we basically get the same expression just in terms of, where did that paste? Oh, here did, sorry, that pasted in a weird place. Um, we basically get the same expression, uh, right? This is A, this is B, and so forth, um, right? Because A is equal to this, B is equal to this, and all we did is we're writing in terms of the generalized coordinates, which is coordinate substitution. Um, and then we get, um, oh, sorry. So if the constraints for the problem are given basically differentially instead of algebraically, we can um, incorporate them directly into Lagrange's equations using uh, Lagrange undetermined multipliers. So um, that basically is telling us if we have uh, equations of this form, uh, differential ones, right? Uh, where again, S is the um, degrees of freedom and M is the uh, number of equations you have that relate stuff, basically. Um, equations of constraint. Then we can immediately put it into our um, basically variational calculus equation. And what we see here is that we have our normal expression, right? Plus some funny factor, right? Um, this basically holds um, because if we add this equation right here to the end, it doesn't affect the equation of motion um, because it equals zero, right? Already. Okay, so thus uh, constraints expressed and this equation right here um, also lead to this equation right here. So basically the undetermined multipliers are these lambdas and they're closely related to the forces of constraint. So the generalized forces of constraint, I call them QJ, that's equal to the sum over k of lambda of k j. Okay. So that was a lot of, I guess, hand wavy math talk. So I think it might help to look at an example for this. And we can kind of see why we care about this method. Okay. So let's consider the case of the disc rolling down an inclined plane that we did last chapter. Um, okay, so here we have the kinetic energy can be separated into um, translational and rotational, and we can basically um, also write the potential energy as mgh, right, where h is given by y minus l sine alpha. Okay. Um, from then on, we can get the Lagrangian, the difference between the two. And then we know the equation of constraint, right, tells us that since it's a disk, right, y minus r theta has to equal zero. Um, 
Now, the system only has one degree of freedom if we say that it's um, not slipping, right? So we can choose to either get rid of y or theta, um, and then we can basically um, do the same method we used earlier in like 7.4, but what happens if we continue to use both? y in theta generalized coordinates and then use this method of undetermined multipliers. So if we use this method of undetermined multipliers, we can rewrite Lagrange's equations of motion. So remember, these are just the normal ones. And then we're adding these undetermined multipliers with the partials of their respective um, the coordinate. So if we perform the differentiation for each individual one, for the Lagrangian, right, we get these expressions. And we also know from the constraint equation that y is equal to r theta. Um, and basically, these equations, this and this, uh, basically allow us to solve for the uh, dynamics of the system. So we basically get using this expression here that theta double dot is equal to y double dot over r, which should make sense because all we're saying here is alpha is equal to a over r, which is pretty straightforward, I think, um, from like lower division classes. Um, but then if we combine these equations and this equation right here, we can get what the undetermined multiplier is. Okay, and we get lambda is equal to one half m y double dot, and then using this expression in this equation right here, we get y double dot is equal to two thirds g sine alpha, with lambda is equal to m g sine alpha over three, and then putting that into equation b right here, we get theta double dot is equal to two thirds g sine alpha over r. And thus, we have three equations for basically the acceleration, angular acceleration, and lambda that we can immediately integrate um, and get the forces of constraint. And let's see what that looks like. So if the disk were to slide without friction down the plane, we, we know that y double dot is equal to g sine alpha. So therefore, the rolling um, constraint reduces the acceleration to two thirds of the value, right? Because it was two thirds of g sine alpha. And then the magnitude of the force of friction would produce the constraint is just um, exactly that undetermined multiplier, mg over three sine alpha. So that's, that's basically what we're talking about with the generalized forces of constraint. We can see that we, uh, they fall out immediately from this lambda. Okay. So, What's important to note is that this is a force. This is a torque. These are. This is just like a general. It's just a general word for it. Just. It's important to note that these are. They have different units. Okay. So now we can also eliminate um, theta dot from the Lagrangian, right? Which I said that we could do up here, right? Because we have y is equal to r theta. Um, and we basically get a simpler equation for Lagrangian. And then we only have one proper coordinate, right? It's just y double dot. And we see that this equation right here is the same as 7.75, which is this equation right here, Okay, if we solve for it. Um, but we don't get the forces of constraint out of it, which that's why this is useful, because we can get these forces out of it. So OK. Um, let's do one more example, I think, because these are this is kind of confusing. At least it was to me and relatively still is. Um, but I think this hemisphere example made more sense to me. So. Let's pretend or say a particle of mass m starts at rest on top of a smooth fixed hemisphere of radius a. Find the force of constraint 
and determine the angle at which the particle leaves the hemisphere. Okay, so let's show you the figure first before I show you the math. So we, we can be on the same page with what we're solving for. So we have this particle moves on the surface of this smooth hemisphere, right? It has to do that based off of some force. And our job is to basically find that force uh, using this constraint equation into Lagrangian. So we can get the Lagrangian from the kinetic and potential energies, which again, generically, is as so, as so. Um, and what we know is we can just set the potential zero down here. And then I guess over here, it's just MGR, right? Okay, so that's why it's MGR cosine theta. Um, and we can just plug it directly into um, the Lagrangian equation. Sorry, the Lagrangian equation with the method of undetermined multipliers. So we're adding these factors again. Okay. And we can differentiate um, these equations. Um, so using this equation right here, uh, what is del F del R? Well, del F del R is uh, 1, because d d r of r is just 1. And then del F del theta is 0. So we get um, we get 1 and 0, and then we can plug it into these equations right here and solve. Um, and we get uh, only the undetermined multiplier there. And from then, we can apply our, cons our constraint that r is equal to a. So therefore, r dot is equal to 0, which is equal to r double dot, because a is just a constant radius. So we can rewrite these equations as, oops, wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, r dot goes away, r double dot goes away. Uh, that's it? Yeah, so we have, and then we plug in r is equal to a, so we have ma theta dot squared minus mg cosine theta plus lambda, these three. And then we have mg a sine theta minus ma squared theta double dot is equal to zero. Um, then from this equation right here, this bottom one, we can get then that theta double dot is equal to g over a sine theta, okay? And we can integrate this equation um, to obtain theta dot, um, which then tells us, theta dot squared, sorry, which then tells us that theta dot squared it, over two, I guess, is equal to negative g over a cosine theta plus um, c, where c is determined as g over a, since theta dot is equal to zero at t is equal to zero when theta is equal to zero. In other words, right there. Um, so now we have a way basically to get lambda up here because we have theta dot squared. We know what that is. Um, and <laughs> that lets us solve for theta, I mean, sorry, uh, lambda, and we get lambda is equal to mg3 cosine theta uh, minus 2, and, uh, oops, I screenshot the same thing again, let me just screenshot the whole thing, uh, which is our force of constraint, right, because remember, the force of constraint is given by these undetermined multipliers, um, and then the particle falls off the hemisphere at an angle theta naught when um, the force is zero, right? So we can set this force equal to zero, and we can find this angle as cosine inverse of two thirds. Um, and we can check at the top, um, the constraint force is mg, right? Right here it's mg, because it would just be pointing straight downwards. Um, And we can notice that that makes sense. Because if this is zero, right, then we just get mg. Yeah, okay. So basically, uh, the point of this chapter, or this section, was that 
there's two uses to this method of undetermined multipliers, and that's that the Lagrange multipliers basically can give us the forces of constraint that we need a lot of times. And then with a proper set of generalized coordinates, it's not necessarily um, desired or too difficult to obtain. Like if the coordinates are not too difficult to obtain, then we can use this method to increase the number of generalized coordinates by including constraint relations between the coordinates. And that's how we get these forces. Okay, um, let me see. I'll just keep going until laundry, then I'll take a break. Um, the next section is actually, I thought, probably the coolest section of this chapter, uh, 7.6. Basically, we can show mathematically the equivalence of Lagrange and Newton. So, we've seen that these look very different on one hand, right? One is um, energy, describes the state of a system. The other is forces, describe the state of a system. One is a scalar, one is a vector. Now, let's explicitly demonstrate that they're equivalent by showing that two sets of equations and motions are in fact the same. So let's choose uh, the rectangular coordinate system. Um, so then for a single particle in Lagrange, right, we have, you know, x1, x2, x3 axes. x1, x2, x3. It's supposed to be 90 degrees, but whatever. It should be like that, I guess, but... Sorry, my handwriting is just bad. So plugging in the definition of Lagrange, T minus U. Um, but we know that in a rectangular coordinates and for a conservative system, um, basically... Oops, let me not skip too far. I don't want to screenshot that. Okay. Um, that the kinetic energy depends on the velocity and the potential depends only on the position. So this has to be zero and this has to be zero because the dependence, right, it's a partial, is only on uh, their respective velocity and uh, position. So we can rewrite Lagrange equations then as the potential of this, I mean the partial of this has to equal the time derivative of that. We can basically equate the two. Okay. Uh, from this equation right here, right? Because, um, so let's think. So this right here goes to zero, so you get a negative, so you get a negative del u del x over here. And then here, um, del, the u goes away, so you just get the t. And you get del del t of, like, d dt of del t del xi over here if that made sense. Um, but we also know, right, that the negative partial with respect to position is just the force on a system, right? For This is for a conservative system. And that the right side right here, right, is just um, the, uh, if we expand it out, right, it's just one half mx dot squared, well that's just the time derivative of the momentum, right? Because this goes down to two, cancel, so we have del del x dot i of one half mx, I guess j, whatever, it doesn't really matter, squared, well that's just mx dot, right? In other words, that's just the momentum. That's this equation right here saying. In other words, this is telling us that the force is equal to the momentum, time derivative, um, and the, which is just Newton's second law, basically, right? Because we have this del del t again. Okay. So we basically get Newton's equations again. So thus we can see that there identical if the generalized coordinates are rectangular coordinates. So this is for a specific case, um, but now let's see if the reverse is true. Uh, if we can get the Lagrangian from basically uh, Newtonian concepts. <clears throat> 
Um, so let's start with some generalized coordinates and generalized momentum. So, oops, oops, easy. So from our earlier uh, generalized equations, we get that x is equal to xi of qj of t, and then the velocity, right, is just um, the sum of the partial of that plus the constant that comes out, right? Uh, because of chain rule, and then um, from there we can see that um, the partial of the velocity with the partial of the generalized coordinates is just the partial of the position, uh, sorry, generalized velocity with the partial of the generalized coordinates. In other words, a generalized momentum um, we can associate with uh, a generalized uh, coordinate uh, from the kinetic energy, right? Because the kinetic energy is just that. Okay. Um, so let's look at an example. Uh, particle moving in plane polar coordinates. Uh, let's say, so the potent, uh, kinetic energy is r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared m over 2, 1 half mv squared, right? And then we have momentum radial is equal to m r dot and then momentum angular is equal to mr squared theta dot. Um, so angular momentum. Um, <laughs> so obviously linear momentum and angular momentum, these you know are pretty established concepts in Newtonian mechanics. So we can determine a generalized force if we consider the virtual work delta w uh, done by a varied path as we saw in section in chapter six, basically last chapter. So we can say that the work, right, the delta work is equal to basically the sum of the forces times the varied path, right? Because work is integral to f dot dr. Um, okay. So then expanding del x using a trick of just these two over each other, we can realize that this expression right here, right, is just the uh, generalized force. And then we get that the generalized force is associated with the generalized position by this expression. <coughs> okay. And since work is always energy, so too is the product of Q and Q, since it's generalized, um, that tells us that if Q is a length, big Q is a force. But if little Q is an angle, this is a torque. Or I guess torque is used as N in this chapter, but our book. So for a conservative system, uh, we can get the generalized force right from the potential energy. So Q of J is equal to, again, generalized potential energy, uh, partial of the potential energy. So we can get Lagrange's equations now, since uh, we have an expression that relates T and momentum and U and generalized force. So if we look at the linear momentum case again, this expression right here, uh, we realize that the momentum can be written as uh, this expression. And then using uh, this expression right here, that del qi dot is equal to del xi over del qi, uh, we can then see that um, taking the derivative of the momentum nets us uh, chain rule basically and we get this expression here and we can expand this term right here like so and then putting it all together we get that the 
um, time derivative of the momentum is basically equal to um, basically it's saying that F is equal to MA um, and then like this right here is the MA term right and then we have the um, partial of the kinetic with respect to the generalized coordinates over here right so looking at that one more time we see the partial of the kinetic is just this expression right here right and this expression right here is equivalent to this expression right here so we can rewrite um, this expression let me just draw an arrow over here as this time derivative of momentum is just equal to the generalized force, right? We have MA right here, generalized force, plus time derivative, uh, or partial, sorry, of the um, kinetic energy with respect to the generalized coordinate. And then um, taking the time derivative and combining, we get uh, this expression here and we know that u does not depend on q dot, right? Since remember, u is always a function of just q or x, right? Then we can rewrite this as the time derivative of the difference of the two, since the u disappears, right? It doesn't matter if we put a u here, because that's 0 anyways. Um, and then doesn't matter if we put a t there because that's zero anyways. Um, and then since we know that L is equal to t minus u, we get del del t, we basically just get Lagrange's equation again. I think the going from Lagrange to Newton is a lot more intuitive than Newton to Lagrange. But we see that it's possible and I'd be lying if I said I was I would have had the foresight to do this myself but um, it is possible and I guess this is the derivation of it okay so we see it goes both ways right logically that means they're equivalent right Newton and Lagrange Remember, it's only equivalent under the stipulations that the force can be written as um, uh, a potential, basically. Okay. Let's get into 7.7 .7 now. Essence of Lagrangian dynamics. Okay. So, basically, before we go any further, this will kind of serve as like an intermission point. Um, we want to basically, uh, you know, summarize a few differences between Lagrange and Newton viewpoints. So historically, Lagrange, uh, his equations of motions were expressed in generalized coordinates, um, and they were actually derived before Hamilton's principle. Now, we, the book by we, chose to derive Lagrange's equation of motions by talking about Hamilton's principle before because it's more straightforward and it's better. It's a better explanation for how you can arrive to Lagrange's equations of motion. Now, Lagrangian dynamics is not a new theory uh, when compared to Newtonian mechanics uh, because the results are the same from Newton as Lagrangian. It's just a different method, basically. So the Newton approach, basically, we care about what's happening externally or acting on the body, the force, basically. Whereas the Lagrangian method, we only care about what's happening with that body, in other words, the kinetic and potential energies. Um, in fact, again, nowhere in this Lagrangian formulation does we ever talk about force. Um, and this is really important, actually, because energy is a scalar, not a vector. Um, and it tells us that a Lagrangian function is invariant to coordinate transformations, um, which basically tells us we can transform between ordinary coordinates and generalized coordinates. 
Um, and another aspect of this like force versus energy viewpoint is that in certain situations, it might not be possible to state all the forces acting on a body, um, like in the cases of forces of constraint, uh, but it might still be possible to give expressions for kinetic and potential energies. And a great example of this would be like in quantum mechanics, where oftentimes you know we know the energy, and we don't really know the forces, basically. Um, so basically, the difference between these two is kind of contained in Hamilton's principle, um, in the sense that like Newton's equations, um, sorry, not the difference, that Newton's equations and their like, you know, calculus sense in mathematical sense are identical to the Lagrangian equations. Um, and as such, uh, there's really no distinction between these two viewpoints. And that's because they're describing physical events. Um, but I guess philosophically, you can kind of make a distinction that Newton is basically cause and effect, whereas Hamilton's principle is uh, more so about purpose. But that's philosophy, and we don't really, at least you might care about that. I guess philosophy is cool, but you get the point. It's not necessarily, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's basically the difference in similarities of the two. So let's talk a little bit about a theorem concerning kinetic energy. The kinetic energy, sorry. Okay. So if the kinetic energy expression is fixed um, and rectangular coordinates, right, the results of the homogeneous quadratic function of the velocity is just one half, you know, mv squared, right? Sum of all. Um, but if we want to basically talk about in generalized coordinates um, and velocities, we have to include these q's basically. Um, we basically want to see how t changes uh, in this. So we can square our velocity using these, again, expressions for our, in terms of generalized coordinates. And this is just the quadratic formula, right? A plus B squared, A squared plus 2AB plus B squared, right? And then the kinetic energy will then become this kind of monster of an expression, right? Where all we did is just add, you know, one half m here. Um, I guess we just multiplied through by one half m, right? Because it's one half m x dot squared. So we basically obtained a result that says t is equal to the sum of, you know, generalized velocity, general velocity plus, you know, a different prefactor, generalized velocity plus a constant. Um, and very interesting um, case happens when the time does not ex uh, appear explicitly in the equations of transformation. In other words, um, time is just the first factor if we set c to zero right because you don't get zero because you set the partial to zero Oops. you set the partial to zero here so now if we take in this specific case uh, which is called sclerinomic um, we can differentiate with respect to um, qi or qj sorry QL. I can't I can't really read this. My eyesight's not the same as it used to be. Stop. Um, so if we differentiate with respect to QL, no Q dot L, sorry, um, into this equation right here of T, um, we see that we get um, this expression. <laughs> 
and if we multiply this equation by uh, QL dot and then sum over L, um, we basically get uh, a special case of Euler's theorem, um, which basically tells us that if f of you know some function y of k is homogeneous and that it's of degree n, oops, uh, this relationship holds true. Okay, um, so I need to go get my laundry. I might take a break for today. So seven point. This is where we'll start. I, mean, I guess for you guys, not that much time, but for me, maybe a bit. Conservation theorems revisited. Yeah, I'm getting a little tired. So, uh, thanks for watching, guys. I will stitch these. Wait, well, I guess. Never mind. I'll just see you guys in like. You guys will see me in a second. <laughs> All right, um, welcome back everybody, but I guess for you guys it's probably not been any time because I'm just going to stitch these together, but I guess without further ado, let's get into um, 7.9. So we're going to revisit some conservation theorems. <clears throat> so the first of which is going to be conservation energy. Energy. <clears throat> So in our previous arguments, we said that time was homogeneous within an inertial reference frame. Um, so therefore, the Lagrangian describes a closed system, that is a system that's not interacting with anything outside that system, and therefore it cannot explicitly depend on time. That tells us the partial of the Lagrangian is zero. <clears throat> and that means the total derivative is just equal to sum of the partials of the um, Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocities and coordinates, which comes from chain rule. Oops, that's supposed to be a Q. Okay. <clears throat> and we see the usual term, uh, del L del T, because it's zero, does not appear anywhere, because it's zero. So, Lagrange's equations, right, tell us that del L del QJ is equal to D DT of del L del Q, or Q dot J. Okay, so we can basically substitute this into this equation here. And then we have del L del T is equal to sum over J of Q dot of J, D DT of del L del Q dot J plus the sum over J of del L del Q dot J Q double dot J. In other words, DL DT minus the sum over J of D DT of Q dot of J del L del Q dot of J has to be equal to zero, such that um, the time derivative of the Lagrangian minus sum over j of the generalized velocity partial Lagrangian is equal to zero. So all we did here was we basically just took out the DDT on both sides over here, and then we just have this basically Lagrangian minus this stuff right here, with of course the summation still there. So this is telling us then that this quantity right here has to be constant in time, right? Because the um, total derivative with respect to time <laughs> um, is zero. So we can actually set this purple stuff equal to negative h, which is a constant. H is the um, Hamiltonian, I believe. So this basically tells us that um, the potential energy U, sorry, if the potential energy U does not explicitly depend on the velocities or the time, then right, U is just equal, oops, sorry, 
u is equal to u of i. So I guess one more thing before I, before I go to the next point. This right here is just telling us that conservation energy exists, right? Because um, this is a constant value. And that's just, in a lot of cases, equal to the total energy. But we'll see what it's really equal to uh, in a second. It's OK. So in other words, um, if we have u equal to u of the generalized coordinate system, that means del u del generalized velocity is 0. <coughs> Because remember, u always depends on the um, position, not the velocity. So therefore, if we use the equation for the Lagrangian, so we have del L del q dot j is equal to del t minus u del q dot j. Well, this u cancels out, right? Because this is 0. So it's just del t del q dot j. Um, and then we can rewrite. Um, basically this equation right here um, as t minus u, so that's L, right, minus sum over j, generalized velocity, partial with respect to just um, the kinetic energy now, because that's what the partial with respect to Lagrangian is, because u is 0, or del u del q, q dot is 0, sorry, and that's equal to negative h. And then we can use an earlier equation. If you guys remember, where we had um, t minus u l minus 2t is equal to negative h. And that was from equation 7.122, which was this one right here. From this equation right here, remember we got 2t is equal to this right here. Okay. So then that basically then tells us that t plus u is equal to, remember the total energy, which is equal to h, which is constant, which is conservation energy. Boom, conservation energy holds. Now this function h is called the Hamiltonian of the system and can be defined as it was um, here where we had L minus sum over J Q J del L del Q J. That's how it's defined. Um, um, but H is only equal to the total energy under two conditions, which is these two, which I will I guess, screenshot, which is that the equations of the transformation connecting the rectangular and generalized coordinates must be independent of time when you transform from x to q, um, thus ensuring the kinetic energy is a homogeneous quadratic function of the generalized velocities. Um, and then the potential energy must be velocity independent, thus allowing the elimination of basically the partial of u with respect to the velocity. In other words, that u is equal to u of just q, not q dot. So, okay, that's a good explanation for conservation energy, Lagrangian. Now let's go to the other conservation. Of linear momentum. Okay. So because again, space is homogeneous in an inertial reference frame, <laughs> The Lagrangian of a closed system is unaffected by translation of the entire system in space, which is basically just a way to restate what we were talking about earlier with the Lagrangian, remember, is a scalar function, so it's invariant under translation. So if we consider an infinitesimal translation of every radius vector, so we have radius vector r alpha goes to r alpha plus some delta r, This amounts to translating the entire system by delta r. So we can examine a system consisting of only a single particle by summing over alpha. We can consider an n-particle system. 
but let's for now just do one system, uh, one particle, sorry. So let's write the Lagrangian in terms of rectangular coordinates, and then the change delta r as change in just delta x of the unit times the unit vector. So what that means is we can write an infinitesimal change in Lagrangian, right, as just Lagrangian plus, I mean, the infinitesimal change and the, or it's the partial Lagrangian times infinitesimal change of uh, each respective um, unit vector from the delta r. So if we can only, if we only consider varied displacement um, such that the um, partials of the xi's are not explicit or implicit functions of time, then we basically get that the time, total time derivative of these partials are zero. Then, according to Lagrange's equations, um, right, the first part goes to zero, right, because we have del L del xi minus this. Um, and if this is zero, then this right here has to be zero as well to make it equal to zero. That then tells us that this function right here is constant. In other words, we can put in our t minus u definition of the Lagrangian. Or again, the u goes away. And we see that the partial of kinetic energy basically just tells us that momentum is constant. And that's conservation of linear momentum. Okay. Now let's look at conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum. Okay, so let's look at some diagram. So we're going to rotate our signal by an infinitesimal angle. So then we can write our um, delta r equal to delta theta cross r <coughs> such that delta r dot is equal to delta theta cross r dot. Uh, and these are all vectors again, just in case it wasn't clear. Um, so again, let's consider a single particle and express it in rectangular coordinates. And then we can get the infinitesimal change in delta L. Uh, same equation as before, right? And we kind of I uh, already saw from before from cosmic momentum that the momentum, I guess, in the i direction is equal to the partial of the Lagrangian respect to the partial of the velocity in that direction. So that lets us rewrite the equations in terms of the momentums, right? And then. Um, That basically tells us that these are zero. I have to add to zero, sorry. Um, so we can rewrite the equations using our relationship we derived earlier here as so. And here we can see that um, we see the expressions for I uh, angular momentum pop out r cross p, um, and because our delta theta is arbitrary, right? Like it can take on any value. Uh, this right here must be equal to zero. In other words, r cross p has to be constant, and we have conservation of angular momentum. So just a little table that summarizes um, what's conserved and what's a proper Lagrangian. So if time is homogeneous, uh, that tells us that the Lagrangian is not explicit function of time, and then the conserved quantity is total energy. We saw that in the first part of this, I guess, new recording. Um, <laughs> space is homogeneous, it's invariant to translation. Linear momentum is conserved. If it's isotropic, invariant to rotation, angular momentum is conserved. Okay, let's go on to 7.10, which is the canonical equations of motion.
Hamiltonian dynamics. Okay, so again, we can start off with, remember the momentum in the I direction is just the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to that, uh, oops, sorry, the velocity. So we can basically write um, a generalized version of this. So we're going to change the indices to J um, as just the exact same thing. It's just we replace X with Q. Um, unfortunately, it's a little confusing. The only, since I and J are dummy indices, um, the variable remains the same. And that's just, I guess, how it was. That's just how the physicists who derived this, they kept the same P. So it'll be a little confusing, but I'll use the indice J to denote what I'm talking about generalized. Okay, so we take oops, um, the generalized, oh, sorry, um, then if we rewrite this equation as the time derivative of the momentum, well that's just equal to the partial of Lagrangian with respect to the generalized position. And then using the definition of the generalized momentum, we can write um, the Hamiltonian as just a sum over J of the generalized momentum um, times the generalized velocity minus L. Now, Lagrangian is considered to be a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocity, and possibly the time. Now, L depends, the dependence of L, sorry, can either come from the time constraints or the transformation equations connecting the generalized and rectangular coordinates. Um, and again, we're not using um, time-dependent potentials. The potentials are constant within time. So we can um, solve um, our first equation, this equation right here, um, <coughs> for the generalized velocities, and we can express them in terms of the generalized position, the um, momentum and the time and as such we can write an expression for the Hamiltonian in terms of the exact same thing as simply uh, this exact expression here just in terms of these values and <clears throat> that lets us know then that the Hamiltonian is always considered a function of the generalized position momentum and time Whereas the Lagrangian is a function of the generalized position, generalized velocity, and time. So that tells us that the total differential of the Hamiltonian is given by um, this expression here, which is basically just the just applying chain rule to our H equation here. Um, and according to um, this is 7.155, I cut off, I guess, the indicator. We can also write this differential Hamiltonian as uh, this expression here, which then means these two are equivalent, and therefore we can substitute into and uh, and simplify and we get this simpler expression. And we can identify the coefficients of this, this, and this. And we find then that Q dot of K is equal to the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum of K right, because then this goes away. Um, and then the other partial is the momentum right here, which is negative non-generalized momentum. Oh, sorry, that is generalized momentum. Um, so that's velocity and that's generalized momentum is equal to the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the generalized position. So we kind of see like these kind of wave-like equations. Um, they're I guess cross-referencing each other and these are called Hamiltonians equations of motions
And that then tells us that the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to time is, in, is the negative of the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to time. Um, and therefore, that the total derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to time is just equal to the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to time, since um, in equation 7.157, in this equation right here, this vanishes from these two equations. And these are, um, these two again, these two equations are Hamiltonian's equations of motion. And um, we have, basically this tells us that we can have 2s canonical equations, or we can have S Lagrange equations. Lagrange equations where S, remember, is the number of degrees of freedom in the system. But these conical equations are first order, whereas Lagrange's, remember, are second order. So in other words, do you want more equations that are easier to solve or less equations that are harder to solve? So let's look at an example of the Hamiltonian method. Um, so we can use the Hamiltonian method to find the equations of motion of a particle of mass m constrained, uh, constrained to move on the surface of a cylinder uh, defined by x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So um, the particle is subject to a force directed toward the origin <coughs> and proportional to the distance of the particle uh, of the particle from the origin. So the situation is depicted in this figure. Let me go pull up that figure. So let's look at the figures, see what we're analyzing. So it has to move on the surface of this. So it can move, you know, across Z no problem. But it has to stay basically <clears throat> according to this equation of constraint, right? So let's write down the potential. Uh, one half kr squared. We got that from the force uh, by integrating. Um, And we can rewrite r as x squared plus y squared plus c squared. And we can replace x and y, since there's no dependence of that, with by r squared by the constraint equation. So now we only have one variable that actually matters, z, or a dependence on one variable. And we can rewrite the velocity and cylindrical coordinates, since we're going to be using cylindrical coordinates, since we're quite literally dealing with a cylinder, so it makes sense. Um, uh, since r is constant, uh, that goes away. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that goes away. Yeah. Um, we can get the um, kinetic energy, and then we can rewrite that. We can write the Lagrangian since we have both the kinetic and potential as L is equal to T minus U, and we get this expression here just by plugging in our values for T and U. And since the generalized coordinates are theta and Z, since remember R is constant. We can write the generalized momentum as just the partials of the Lagrangian with respect to um, the generalized velocity, or just the velocity of their respective angular or linear cases. And we get mr squared omega and mv, basically. Um, now the system is conservative because the equations of transformation between rectangular and cylindrical do not involve time, right? Like, uh, you know, z is equal to r cosine theta, or that's for spherical, but you get the point. There's no, it depends on time. So we can basically write the Hamiltonian now as just t plus u, since it's conservative, and this pops out. And we're rewriting uh, t and u in terms of the momentums. And from there, we can use the conical equations, Hamiltonian's conical equations, right, um, to basically get the uh, velocity, or well, both the velocities. And what we see is that these are basically just duplicates of our earlier equation. Um, 
these two right here so they don't really help us but um, what we do get then is that the angular momentum is equal to m r squared theta dot which is constant so great angular momentum is conserved um, about the z-axis and then if we combine um, the linear momentum equation which is del l del z dot is equal to m z dot and um, if we combine the derivative of the momentum as negative partial to Hamiltonian with respect to z, we get negative kz, kz, sorry about that, kz. If we combine those, we get z double dot plus omega naught squared z is equal to zero, where if we look at this, this is just the classic um, harmonic relation, so we have omega naught squared is equal to k over m where we just define omega naught squared as a over m. Okay. Now we can also solve this problem using Lagrangian, but uh, the whole point was to do it with the Hamiltonian. So let's do one more example using the Hamiltonian. So use the Hamiltonian method to find the equations of motion of for a spherical pendulum of mass m and length b <coughs> with generalized coordinates theta and phi. Okay, so this pendulum is also spinning like so, or I guess like so. Okay, so the only force acting on the pendulum, right, is gravity, and we can define the potential zero uh, to be at the pendulum's point of attachment, so down there. So we can get our height by b cosine theta, and then we can write our generalized momenta from t and u. And then we can solve these equations to basically get um, theta dot and phi dot in terms of the momentums and we can determine the Hamiltonian since h is equal to t plus u because um, energy is conserved again um, because there's no explicit time dependence right in the uh, generalized to non-generalized coordinates and we get the Hamiltonian in terms of angular momentum and I guess a different kind of angular momentum about a different axis um, and that lets us immediately get the equations of motion which tell us then that omega right theta dot is just momentum is just related to the momentum phi dot is equal to the other momentum divided by this other relation and then we can get um, basically the time derivative of the momentum and that basically tells us then that um, since what's it called this is a cyclic motion right here we expect phi to be zero <clears throat> the phi direction to be zero sorry in other words, the symmetry is constant around this axis. Okay, so let's wrap up this video with 7.11, which is a long title, so I'll screenshot it. <laughs> uh, some comments regarding, dyna the, regarding dynamic variables in variational calculus and physics. Um, so I'll kind of skip over the words, but Let's go to the equations. Um, we basically saw, right, from chapter six, how to use the variational uh, calculus. And we did that with a Lagrangian, and we expressed Hamilton's principle as just the variational procedure of the Hamiltonian. And when you bring this inside, you get this expression here, which then tells you that these right here uh, basically must be zero, or must be 
integrate to zero. Um, so then we can assert then that these two, or if we choose to assert these, are not independent. So the variation operation and time differentiation can be exchanged. And then the varied integral after we integrate by parts. So if you guys remember from chapter uh, 6.7, we take this right here, we integrate by parts. If you guys remember, that's like integral of v du is equal to u b minus integral of uh, u dv, something like that. If we take the limits here, this goes to zero, uh, like from whatever. These always go to zero, and this is the integral we're left with. And that's what this right here is, um, which, and the reason why these are zero is because if you remember from the variational method, we have like two paths, right? This is our varied path. The limits here are exactly the same on the path, and we care about the difference between the two paths, so that's why this is zero. Um, but anyways, um, this then tells us that we basically derive, this right here is Lagrange's condition, right? Well, Lagrange's, I guess, Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, and then we basically saw that we can kind of modify this formulation um, into the modified Hamilton's principle um, by defining the Hamiltonian. And then we can rewrite uh, this equation right here as this equation right here. Oh, sorry, this equation right here. And again, we just see, basically just by substituting in this for this right here from this equation. And we can carry out the variation again, standard manner, bringing that in, uh, chain rolling it out. And we see that um, in this formulation, um, generalized position and momentum are considered to be independent but the generalized velocity is not independent of the generalized position. So we can rewrite these equations as so, and then we can integrate by parts. And this term, the integrated term vanishes. Um, so we're left with this relationship. And then we can rewrite this equation as basically this. And it shows that um, if basically these two, right, are independent, um, then these right here must separately vanish, like if these two don't depend on each other. And that then tells us that, um, well, that's just Hamiltonian's equations, right? Because that then tells us that Q, oops, sorry, that tells us that this has to be equal to this, and this has to be equal to this, or the negative. This must be equal to the negative of that, but yeah. And that's if these two are independent. Okay. So that's kind of it for um, this chapter. It was a very long chapter. Um, there are two more optional sections that I will not be going over because of how long this video already is. But um, <clears throat> I guess. Thanks for watching, and then next time we'll be going over chapter 8, which is Central Force Motion. Okay, peace.